Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the fifth BSAT online talk sponsored by Roundtree Trail after our summer break. Again, I would like to thank Jamie Roundtree for his generous support for these lectures. It means that we do not have to charge and means that we can get to a much wider audience. Today, uh, I'd like to welcome Chris Garibaldi, who's going to talk about the architectural history of Palace House in Newmarket. Palace House is the last remaining portion of the palace built by Charles II and now houses a permanent collection of British sporting art. In many ways, it's our spiritual home and I would urge everybody to go and visit. Palace House was the sporting palace for the Stuart Kings and Queen, and it's obviously an appropriate place in which to display sporting art. I find it difficult to believe that I've worked with Chris for 11 years uh, since he was in first interviewed for the job of the first director of the National Heritage Centre for Horse Racing and British Sporting Art. Uh, Chris came to the project after a number of significant jobs in the cultural and heritage sector. Uh, his first job was cataloguing the silver collection at Audley End uh, for English heritage, and then he moved on to do the same job for the Queen cataloguing the silver at Buckingham Palace, Windsor Castle and other royal residences. Anyone from NADFAS, as it was called then, who worked on the racing trophies for the museum will know his knowledge of and passion for the subject. In 1998, he was appointed Keeper of Direct Decorative Art and then Senior Curator at Norwich Castle Museum. Uh, he curated a couple of significant exhibitions while he was there one on uh, the British table and the other on flower power, uh, which looked at the symbolic meaning of flowers in art from the medieval period. After a few years, he felt he needed to learn about business and went off to Cape Town to get an MBA uh, before returning to the UK to take up the job at Newmarket. Many will know Chris from his time at Newmarket, particularly the time leading up to the successful opening of the Heritage Centre by the Queen in 2016. Throughout his time, Chris kept asking questions about the history of the palace. Some were answered, many were left hanging unresolved. Now he has the time to answer his own questions as he studies for his direct doctorate on aspects of the history of royal patronage, specifically the architectural history and significance of the palaces at Newmarket from the early 17th century. I'm keen to see how he's uh, getting on with his studies and how he's finding the questions answered. As before, uh, Chris will answer questions at the end of his talk. If you have a question, the procedure is to use the Q&A button on the bottom right hand corner of the screen. Uh, and type a question there. This can be done throughout his talk. I will see the questions as they come in. And I will be able to put them to Chris at the end. The second point, and Sally has already made this point, is that the recording of these talks and making them available through the BSAT website. So if you want to revisit this talk or go back to previous talks, please do so through the website. So now I'll hand over to Chris. Um, at one point, looking at Chris on screen, he's achieved the remarkable uh, achievement of looking much younger than he did when he first started at the Horse Racing Museum. Over to you, Chris. <laughs> Thanks very much, Tim. Thank you for uh, your very flattering introduction. I'll just share the screen so that um, you see the slideshow. So let's... Oh. Sorry. Sorry, it was just defaulting to asking me whether I wanted to show better presentations is not now. <laughs> thank you very much. Oh, the computer's wonderful. So thank you very much. I mean, what I'm going to be talking about to you today is a very, very um, broad brushstroke approach to the architectural history of the palaces at Newmarket. And I've entitled it rather grandly, Latest uh, Research. And I think it might possibly better have been entitled um, Work in Progress, because I'm very much still at the start of this um, exercise. Um, my first year at Cambridge was an MPhil that really scoped the project as a whole, looked at the, um, in a sense, a literary review of all the sources that I could possibly find relating to the architecture 
of the um, uh, palaces at Newmarket Mall has always got to remember that in effect there are or were three um, iterations. James I's first very modest building um, built between uh, 1609 and around 1613. Then there is the rather dramatic collapse of the King's lodgings. There's a wonderful account of the um, lintels breaking and the windows exploding outwards and the King being dragged in the middle of the night out of uh, the palace, literally taken from his bed and sort of stood in the um, high street of Newmarket as the building kind of uh, collapsed around his ears. As with everything to do with the um, uh, the history of, of, of the palace. I, one's got to be slightly careful in terms of understanding what has been exaggerated in, in the telling. Um, uh, certainly the uh, source material for that, that story seems fairly good. Um, whether it was quite as dramatic as some of the later accounts suggest is, is, is open to um, question. But what it certainly we can say is that it was a fairly perhaps shoddy is putting it too strongly, but but a not particularly finely built uh, edifice which had serious structural problems. So between 1613 and 1625, the death of King, um, a, a, a significant amount of money was put into building a new uh, palace on the same site in, in Newmarket all of which, or the majority of which, was pulled down in the 1650s under um, the uh, uh, parliamentary Cromwellian uh, period. As part of that, I think, um, intentional, very self-conscious desire to um, uh, suppress Newmarket as a base for racing. But there are many um, subtleties we can go into in terms of the uh, discussion about precisely why that was um, uh, undertaken. The parliamentary survey describes the palaces, uh, the king's lodgings at least, uh, as having been in very good repair when the palaces sold off in the 1650s. And so I think we, uh, uh, we need to do a little bit more research to understand why then the decision was taken to, to pull those, those buildings down. But, um, uh, and then of course it's the, 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 the um, 1660s that see the um, third, if you like, uh, iteration of the Royal Palace in uh, William Samwell's building built between 1668 and 1671. And it's that 1671 uh, anniversary that we're celebrating at the moment in terms of the 350th um, uh, year of, of Palace House's existence. But I think um, before we go any further, one of the things that I think is always worth saying is that um, in, in Isaac Newton's uh, phrase, one sits on the shoulders of giants in terms of any research one does. And part of me, uh, my um, uh, MPhil was to look at what literature already existed. And certainly the, the one of the most important sources that everybody relies on in looking at Newmarket is J.P. Hawes' three volume history of, of Newmarket and Annals of the Turf, a really um, thorough antiquarian work, which looks in very, very um, precise detail. He did an enormous amount of work in the uh, National Archives, looking at the um, court uh, documents relating to the building of the uh, various palaces. Um, in, if, if I've got a criticism of, of Hoare, it's actually that in some cases he, he is almost too expansive in the history that he tries to cover. And I don't know about anyone else, but I tend to find these volumes slightly hard going in, in, in terms of their reading style. Published in the 1880s, between 1885 and 1886, the three volumes are a very, if you like, um, reliable, old-fashioned antiquarian approach to the history of, of the buildings. And then and they were joined in 1889 by his book on the sporting and rural records of the Cheveley estate, which is another crucially important source for understanding the history of Newmarket and its environs in the sort of slightly wider um, area. And then there was something sort of gap in scholarship between the 1880s and the 1970s, 1980s, uh, where uh, Hall's work was in effect re, um, regurgitated by, by, by authors until the publication of the um, History of the King's Works under the editorship of, of Howard Colvin, very, very um, important architectural historian in this, in this country. Um, the three um, volumes that, that 
deal with uh, new market, um, mostly our volumes four, five, and, and, and six. But one of the things that it's worth saying is you can see the sort of the, the, the thickness of those three volumes. Um, in fact, uh, the King's Works deals with Newmarket in probably no more than 15 to 20 pages of that entire work. And I think what it's worth saying, therefore, is that the history of Newmarket um, and the palaces is something of a fragmented scholarship. It's all in different bits of, of, of literature. And one of the things we did, the pretty well the first thing we did in as part of the redevelopment project was to commission from Purcell Mill and Tritton a conservation management plan which attempted to draw all these sources together to inform our understanding of how we were going to redevelop the buildings. Very important to understand the significance of those spaces. And particularly, I must pay tribute to the work of Eileen, uh, Dr. Eileen Reed. Um, Eileen uh, uh, produced a very comprehensive gazetteer of uh, historic sources relating to the palace. And really, my work springs from this in that what became apparent in that exercise is an alien's um, uh, uh, phrase, that the sources were uh, practically limitless. Um, and what I'm doing now is trying to um, follow those through. And of course, one must also acknowledge <laughs> in terms of David Audrey, Tim um, Cox and Richard Nash's work, everything I know about the Heath is based on, on, on this. So those are the sort of core works that I think form the foundation for the work that I'm carrying forward. And one of the things that I think is quite interesting about Newmarket is that it's been done something of a disservice by some of the remarks that have made been made about it in the past. Um, it's always been styled as a minor house, as a hunting lodge, in some cases a hunting box. And I think that's led to a um, possible misunderstanding about its significance. It um, yes, was uh, 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 originally a property established for uh, James I uh, as part of that hunting circuit that he um, took part in. He um, frequently went on, 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 on progress through um, Tybalt's um, or Theobald's, whichever way you like to pronounce it, um, Royston, his hunting lodge at Newmarket and at Thetford in a sort of circuit frequently um, coming sort of up to uh, the sort of the end of the circuit was, was the King's house in Thetford and then he came back through Newmarket and back down to London. During periods of, of predominant, often plague, it was um, uh, when London was, was, was afflicted by plague, one of the things he did was come out of London to the healthy environment of, of Newmarket and, and, and Royston and Thetford. But one of the things that I think that's led to is it's, a misunderstanding of the significance of, of Newmarket. Apart from anything else, one has to ask the question, after the um, English Civil War, Thetford had fallen away anyway, it was given away by Charles I um, in 1624. Tybalt's Royston, there's no attempt to rebuild those, and yet there is a very, very um, uh, self-conscious effort on the part of Charles II to rebuild Newmarket. And indeed, it survived right the way through until the 1850s. Okay, in the latter part of the, uh, of the 18th and early 19th centuries, it wasn't used mass much by the um, royal family. And there were several attempts from the early 19, uh, sorry, the early 1800s to sell the property off. Nevertheless, it's a royal property that existed for 200, just, just short of 250 years. And I think it's important to ask, uh, ask some questions about its, it, its status. And one of those things, uh, aspects, is I think the dismissal of hunting sometimes only expressed in terms of the private pleasures and pursuits of, of, the, uh, of the king. Particularly James I is sometimes stylized in historic discourse as um, uh, he, he went to, uh, to Newmarket to, to, to pursue his obsession with hunting. And it was almost like whilst he was out of the court, the sort of ministers like Cecil and people like that got um, uh, sort of did the real ruling. And I think it's a fundamental misunderstanding of where hunting existed in um, the, the, the culture 
of of one might say Renaissance kingship, um, which uh, in which James I was was fundamentally embedded. One of the interesting things Simon Thurley made the point in a very um, uh, uh, interesting article about the um, palace or if you like a royal house at uh, Royston in country life a few years ago, is that um, uh, James I was not the sort of uh, rabid hunting uh, uh, monarch that he sometimes portrayed uh, as, but one of the reasons why Royston particularly was interesting to him as a property was its proximity to Cambridge. He often was calling on divines from Cambridge, uh, scholars who came down to meet him in Royston, and he um, uh, debated religious matters there. And in fact, as Simon Thurley suggests that he only uh, hunted for about three days a week and the rest of the week in both Royston and Newmarket, he was writing and conducting court uh, business. And I think it's really important to understand that hunting was not the sort of private pleasure of the monarch when he wasn't being king. It was a fundamental aspect of the notions of a Renaissance prince um, with um, uh, there's a lot of literature relating to um, the idea of, of, of the, the kingly quality of hunting, and particularly stag hunting, which is why I put this image up from the Fitzwilliam collection of uh, stag hunting in front of Nonsuch Palace in um, uh, 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 Surrey. And um, so in terms of uh, Newmarket's royal palaces, this is from the Chapman uh, map of 1768, we know if we focus on it, that the old King's Yard, it's marked as, um, is the area uh, uh, occupied currently by Moon's Toy Shop. And a lot of my uh, research is looking at this particular um, site to try and unlock some of the history of, of the first palace. We have an incredible amount of information about these royal palaces because of, of uh, uh, this. It's the parliamentary survey that took place in uh, 1649, um, looking at all the individual royal palaces and um, in a sense codifying them, schematizing them uh, uh, prior to them being uh, uh, sold off. Um, this in fact is, is the uh, survey for Royston. Um, one of the reasons I just thought I put it up is I think they're absolutely beautiful. Um, the calligraphy is, is, is wonderful. This is in the National Archive at um, Kew. Now, the interesting thing about this, um, the body of documentation that sits behind the first palace is um, how extensive um, it, it is. And one of the things I'm doing is working through the account rolls. They're very, very um, elaborate records that were kept by the um, treasury officials on the individual expenditure on, on the palaces, trying to build up uh, an image literally brick by brick of what was um, built. But in terms of other evidence, we have um, fortuitously uh, the um, uh, uh, survey undertaken of the whole uh, palace site by um, Thomas Fort in the 1720s. And again, this exists, uh, this is preserved in the National um, Archive. And uh, just showing you really how we, I, I'm trying to, in a sense, produce a triangulated approach to this. So we're looking at, uh, uh, visual evidence, uh, archive evidence, and also the physical evidence of the remains of both the Jacobean and the Charles II uh, palace and that forms Palace House. One of the slight um, hiccups is that in the Thomas Fort survey from the 1720s, which is the, uh, in a sense, the earliest comprehensive uh, view of this site, we have a great gap in the narrative. You'll see that um, area that I've marked out in uh, blue is unfortunately excluded from the fort plan. I think it's because the fort plan, although in a bound volume, uh, was probably copied from a plan that was put together um, in relation to a lease that was provided on the palace in 1721 to the Duke of um, Somerset. Um, and at that point, this portion of the site, marked out in blue, had already been leased out to someone else. In 1676, this portion of the site had been leased to um, Thomas Elliot, gentleman of the bedchamber, and so was excluded from, uh, I think, this survey because it was already in um, someone else's uh, hands. Now, 
the whole question of this lease that was granted to um, uh, the um, Duke of Somerset is a really important one, which I'll come on to in a, a, a minute, because it has real significance in our understanding of the new palace um, at uh, Palace House. So the old King's Yard on the left, the new King's uh, Palace uh, built between 1668 and 1671. And that um, I've ringed is the uh, element, the King's Pavilion that survives in the form of Palace House itself. And of course, that block over the road is the King's uh, stables associated with the palace. Much debate about whether they were racing stables or whether they were just the uh, general stables of the palace. And I think it's worth asking the question anyway, in the 1660s, 1670s, when Charles II is in occupation, is there a fine, uh, a neat division between a racing uh, a stables and a, a, a general stables? I think the two are much more muddled at the beginning of the, the end of the uh, 17th uh, century, beginning of the 18th uh, century. So the fort plan is absolutely wonderful in terms of the detail it provides to us of um, the uh, Samwell uh, building. And one of the great joys of my time at the moment is being able to go back into the archive and photograph and re-photograph and re-photograph and get some really high resolution images, which one can then blow up much larger than their actual size and gather a huge amount of information about what, um, uh, what was going on in these uh, architectural uh, structures. Just to be clear, we've got the um, uh, stables on the right-hand uh, side, sorry that's um palace house and that's the uh, same there i've just marked out the footprint of the present trainer's house because we talk about the spine wall which is this wall here which sits in what's the the, the present museum um shop uh, area and through to uh, the ground floor gallery but of course it was the back wall of the original um, building and I think it's important to understand what one's looking at when one's standing in the shop looking at that wonderful survival of the um, back wall of the Charles II uh, stables. And of course Time Team, uh, you may remember in 2011, helped us excavate the front area of the, um, uh, the uh, stables block. And one of the things that I'm trying to do is really analyze the, um, uh, uh, the archeological evidence of, um, that was conducted during the process of the redevelopment to see how that also informs our understanding of the architectural history the palace and there are wonderful survivals still not quite sure that I can tell you exactly where this came from but this is of course the underside of the steps in the king's yard um, uh, that um, you um, they, they look a very plain set of steps on the other side but underneath if you look underneath it's very clear that there are recycled cornice from one of the earlier um, buildings. I think at the moment I'm prepared to say that I probably <laughs> think that they come from the front facade of the stables um, built or at least repaired and rebuilt for Charles II uh, and pulled down in the 1850s when the site is finally sold off. But as I say, I would underline and emphasize this is very much work in progress. Um, I hope in a couple of years to be able to come up with some answers to the very detailed questions I'm, I'm asking all the time. Because so often with histories of New Market, the question is, well, how do we know that? And actually, when you look at the literature and you track it back, it sometimes um, just evaporates into a sort of uh, a myth of, of, of hearsay. And sometimes, and in one particular uh, uh, context, we know that it's actually now based on, on, on an error. So the other um, uh, wonderful source of, of visual evidence for the palace is, of course, the paintings that were produced um, at this time. And um, this is perhaps the most famous important image of the, um, uh, uh, the, the palace in uh, Newmarket, the John Wooten image from um, uh, showing George I attending Newmarket races in 1717, although this uh, seems to be him on at the bottom of Warren Hill uh, looking at horses uh, exercising, and in fact there's huntsmen as well, so it may well be that he, he was hunting as part of his sort of entertainment. And if we look into the um, uh, far sort of uh, mid-ground of, of, of the painting, um, one of the things I've been trying to do is establish exactly where this um, 
uh, uh, painting was taken from. And I think it was from this area on the heath. So the normal views you see of Warren Hill are from sort of around about this area, whereas I think it's much, much further over. This red line indicates the um, viewing point from the Sybarix painting of Newmarket, which sits in the um, Rutland collection at Beaver Castle. And again, it's hugely informative. Of, of what we see. But here we're looking at Wooten and you can see the palace buildings, but importantly, you can see some of the other subsidiary buildings. This I believe to be the uh, dog kennel at the end of the King's Close area that sits behind All Saints Church. And on the um, right hand uh, side of the, the plate, I think these are the uh, arms houses that are see clearly seen on the um, uh, Chapman map. And again, by taking or being able to access high resolution images of this painting, one can blow them up larger than life size, and it provides a huge amount of information and detail about the structures that we see um, that uh, have been uh, lost to us. But always one's got to ask the question, how accurate were these artists? Um, are they just being fanciful? Um, and I think something of that is answered by this. I came across in the uh, British Library collections, uh, this watercolor on the left of the old All Saints Church in Newmarket. And you see it with that very clear crenellated um, uh, top to it. Um, it was orientated around the different way from the, the present um, uh, uh, All Saints Church. And what can you see in the uh, Wooten, but a very, very close rendition of it. So not exact. So I think one's always got to say with these images, slightly um, apply a certain degree of, of, of skepticism. But when you put the paintings together with the architectural plans, and then the um, a building record evidence um, in the um, royal accounts, which are still in the National Archive, one starts to get a very, very clear, precise image of what's going on. And I'm just a bit um, uh, uh, concerned about time, so I'll just flash through a number of these images. Another very important, often sort of dismissed as a rather um, subsidiary image, um, this one uh, wonderful um, uh, print of Palace House, um, published in 18. Uh, 30, which um, again shows us a very important amount of information about the palace uh, buildings, the Samwell structure on the right hand uh, side. So I'm going to um, actually stop there, return um, the, uh, uh, um, uh, the window to Tim and take any uh, questions because I'm sure there'll be a, a, a lot. I'm sorry, um, it, 20 minutes is not a long time to, to get across what I've been basically working on for, as Tim said, the last 11 years. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, still some questions to answer. Um, Lots. Um, you say it was a Crown property. Um, when did it stop being a crown property and why was it sold off? Right, actually, uh, uh, yes, I should say that's one of the big things that I, I think I can announce as a discovery um, is one of the, and I put it in inverted commas because I don't want to be unkind, the sort of myths that has developed about Newmarket um, at the palace is that it was leased to the um, Duke of Somerset in 1721. And this is perfectly understandable, but when you look back at the trail of evidence, actually it's all based on Hawes um, sporting records of the Chievely estate, where he transcribes or quotes the lease to the grand, uh, to the um, Duke of, of, of Somerset. And he says that the palace was leased out. Aileen's um, uh, review of the, 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 the literature and the conservation management plan just alerted us to the fact that the copy of the lease that she found uh, in the National Archive said the old palace. And I sort of was very disconcerted about this. So what I've done is I think managed now to trace all the copies of the lease. There's uh, copies in the um, uh, Sussex Record Office, there's copies of it in the um, National Archive, and in the archive at uh, Rutland, at Beaver. And it's absolutely clear that the both the um, preparatory, if you like, um, agreement for lease, which is written in English, 
um, says the old palace, the site on which the buildings of the old palace stood. And then if you look at the Latin lease, which takes a bit of going through, but actually they correspond quite well. So it's not that hard to actually translate the Latin. It clearly says the old palace. So we've been sort of existing with a bit of a myth that between 1721 and 1750, for 30 years, the Duke of Somerset had possession of the palace. He didn't. He had possession of the old palace on Newmarket High Street. The main palace remained under the direct control of, of the crown. So one of the things that I'm doing in my research now is looking at the records for that 30 year period between 1721 and 1750 to see what we can find out about how the palace was or was not used um, by the royal family. We know that it wasn't very uh, uh, heavily used by, by George I or George II, but what were other people uh, doing? What did Frederick Prince of Wales go to, 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 to uh, Newmarket? So there's a, it's, it's one of these wonderful things where we've solved one question, which was to say that Hall unfortunately had made a mistake in his transcriptional quotation of, of the 1721 lease. But what it's done is exploded a whole load of questions now about how was the palace used for that 30 year period. And then, we have the final sort of period between around 1816 to 1850, which is quite a long period where there are various efforts to sell off uh, the, the, the palace. And finally achieved in, in, in the 1850s, it seems that in fact, it may well have been sold off in 1819, but purchased by the Prince of Wales, George IV, who bought it in a sense back into royal uh, ownership. Um, it's still, I'm still slightly uncertain of the exact uh, um, uh, series of events that led to its disposal in the 1850s. But what is very useful is that those sales catalogues in um, the early 1800s really dismissed the buildings nothing more than worth building materials. But as a result, they are very, very specific in the, 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 the detail they provide of the physical makeup of the buildings. And I'm trying to unlock the evidence from those as to what, how that informs us of, of, of what the 1671 building uh, looked like. Thank you. Um, do we know who conducted the 1649 parliamentary survey? And how much uh, yes, information we... does it give us about the old palace? Um, so take those in order. Yes, we do know it's all assigned by a series of, of administrators um, whose names I can't remember at the moment. <laughs> There's a whole bevy of them. Um, it was a very, very formal process whereby the, um, in, uh, the survey was made and it was signed and it was countersigned by various officers of the administration. And it provides a huge amount of information on the old palace. It describes each individual building, gives its outer dimensions, in some cases gives us um, information about the uh, structures, the um, materials that we used and what I'm trying to do at the moment is compare that with the information on the um, materials and the structures that we provide from the original building accounts but whereas the survey as I showed you is written in this beautiful clear script the account rolls are very very difficult to read um, and so I'm, I'm working my way through and they're also enormous there's these huge rolls that you unroll at the National Archive um, and I'm gradually working my way through to try and get a comprehensive set of transcripts that we can then use sort of from now on um, as, 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 as a sort of primary evidence for, for what those buildings look like. Um, Hoare did a lot of this but given that he made this rather fundamental mistake in relation to the 1721 lease, I think um, it's absolutely uh, uh, beholden on me to go back to the original documentation and make new transcripts. So that's what I'm beavering away on at the, uh, at the moment. Um, the other thing to say about the, um, uh, the, the survey is that it, 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 it very clearly says that the buildings, some of it dismisses, some of the sort of stable buildings were in poor repair, but it clearly says that both the King's lodgings and the, uh, particularly the Prince's lodgings built for the Prince of Wales were in good repair and would make a fine townhouse. And yet the building was pulled down. And I think we need to understand a bit more about why that decision was made um, to sort of level the site. And the question 
but I'm really asking at the moment in terms of looking on site with sort of Moon's a toy shop and King's a wine bar that occupy those sites is Ford, who was the keeper of the um, uh, palace, when uh, Charles II is restored in 1660, writes a petition and says um, everything's been pulled down and these terrible people did this ghastly thing and please can I be reinstated? And one of the questions is where he says it was all pulled down, it was sort of flattened, was it? What structures may have survived that we can sort of at least see the footprint in the modern uh, buildings? When we look at Moon's Toy Shop, we are not looking at the lodgings of, Char of James I, let's be absolutely clear about that. We may be looking at a building built on its foundations, but until one's really got the evidence, I, I, I don't think one can say with any sense of, of, of clarity which building sat where on that site. It's good to hear you're using your Latin uh, lessons from school days <laughs> to good effect. Um, <laughs> Very dog Latin, I can tell you. <laughs> um, uh, William Samwell, you mentioned as the architect, um, he seems a mysterious figure. I, mean, I think he has built other buildings around. What, what's his status? How important was he to Charles II and building at that time? Well, I think he, yeah, he's a really interesting architect because he seems to have had um, an odd status. He's, he's sort of in this group of gentleman architects um, Roger Pratt, people like that, who, who were, I think in some ways, a sort of major contractor. He sometimes dismissed as, oh, he wasn't a part of the sort of work, office of works, um, and therefore was, was slightly to the sort of the side of, of royal building. But he was clearly used for a number of, of projects. Um, he, um, there are about seven buildings that are known to have been by, by Samwell. Um, and um, in fact, I'm going to just share- the, Coming uh, back in, Tim. I'm sorry, sorry. I, I do, do apologize. Okay. He's got me out now. Uh, oh, oh, well, right. okay. uh, while I'm uh, on screen, there's just one question I'd like to ask and I can just type it mm. in. Uh, on the Wooten picture, uh, mm. looking down onto Newmarket, how do you think he got the accuracy of the picture when he was painting? Do you think he was using merely observations or do you think he was working from maps and plans? I think it's a combination of, of working th uh, with, with maps and plans and taking elevations from, 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 from uh, ground plans. But also, um, I think it's Judy Edgerton in her catalogue of the Paul Mellon collection actually suggests that the, the figure um, at the front of the Wooten is a portrait of Wooten himself. He's put himself in right in the centre of the um, image with his sort of um, canvas, his obviously drawing. And it appears something is sitting next to him. And the point was made that this may well be a telescope. Um, and I think the whole question of how these artists, um, what surveying equipment they use to provide, produce these, these images is a really interesting one. I mean, particularly when you think of the Sibirix image um, from the 1680s, is what kind of magnification was he using? What kind of, of vantage point and viewing point was he used to take uh, his uh, to create his image of Cheveley Park in the foreground, then with this very, very detailed image, once you blow it up, of, of Newmarket in, in, in the, the background. Um, yes, there were fairly um, established techniques of, of, for archi architect artists to produce an elevation from a, a two-dimensional plan. It, it, it's a fairly easy thing to do once you know the technique. But I think this, the, the, the wealth of topographical information that these artists include also show that they're using very, very close observation. One idea I had about the Cheveley Park image is that he may have actually gone onto the church uh, tower at Cheveley, and that may have provided him with this incredibly um, interesting view of both Cheveley Park and Newmarket in the background. But I think in Wooden's case, when you look at the image, he's sitting firmly in the sort of centre of that picture. It's probably the use of a telescope in combination with plans. Thank you. <laughs> right, I think um, just one last question, Chris. Um, I hope you stay with us. Um, <laughs> uh, what, the, the furnishings and furniture, I think, were also um, recorded in great detail in Newmarket. Uh, do any of those contents remain? Have they been dispersed? 
Um, are they significant as in understanding what was going on at the palace? Yes, I mean, I think, um, firstly, the information about the furnishings is huge. What has survived in the National Archives are all the great wardrobe accounts um, that came under Lord Chamberlain's office. And the great wardrobe accounts give precise details, every bit of cloth, uh, furnishing, furniture, um, window dressing that was ever ordered, those lists still exist. And again, the reason my research is actually taking the time it's taking is that I'm trying to go through those very, very systematically to build up a picture of, of the uh, contents of the palace. Eileen uh, Reed in her, uh, her work first sort of alerted us to, to, to the, the extent of that record. And it's something that I'm, I'm interrogating. I've come across something new or, or certainly was new for me is that there's also an inventory that was made um, in 1688 for James II. Um, which sits in the British Library, which again lists some of the standing furniture. So we know quite a lot of detail about things like the state beds. Um, there was uh, a th uh, um, certainly uh, in James I. Chris, you're going. Uh... Um, a palace. It specifically tells us there was a state chair, i.e., a throne. Okay. Is that right? One, right. one of the things that um, the uh, um, furnishing records allow us to build up is a very detailed picture of the internal um, arrangement of these spaces and underlines the status of the building. Architectural historians have tended to say this is a rather dull building because it wasn't from the outside in so fantastically uh, uh, significant and yet they ignore the fact that we exist in spaces from the inside out and we experience architectural spaces from the inside out and one of the things that the i've realized from the um inventory that survived from the 1780s is wonderfully it gives us the original names of the rooms as opposed to the rather anachronistic inaccurate names that they're given by the time Chawner does his plan of the palace in 1816. So what that's allowed me to do is recreate what I think is the formal route through guard room, um, presence chamber, privy chamber, withdrawing room, etc. And what you what comes across loud and clear is that the full kit of a monarch was included in these buildings. And that sort of redresses a slight misunderstanding of them being de described as a hunting lodge, which then starts to create this idea of a hunting box or even the Elizabethan notion of a hunting uh, uh, lodge, which was uh, uh, got a couple of rooms to literally just keep you keep you um, out of the wet inclement weather while you were hunting in the field. As to whether the pieces have survived, that's the great treasure hunt I'm on at the moment. Um, some we do know, we know that tapestries have survived at Holyrood in, in, in Edinburgh, um, but uh, there's, there's a possibility that more has survived than, than, than we previously thought, but I don't know where it is at the moment. I mean, what is certainly true, clear, is that a lot of the furnishings like the state beds were only removed at the end of the 18th and the early 19th century. And at the moment, and, and they just wouldn't have been thrown away. They were very prestigious, expensive objects. So one of the things I, I'm, I'm hunting around for now is, is whether we can find any of the furniture having been dispersed to other um, properties, possibly non-royal properties. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned Thomas Elliot taking a lease on land mm next to the he yeah. was one of the racing uh, yeah. uh partners of charles ii and he's mentioned in races which you've probably picked up so he's probably a more significant person than just another jockey uh at yes Newmarket, no no absolutely. which is what i'd understood <laughs> no, and also, I mean, you know, he was Thomas Elliot, he was gentleman of the bedchamber. He had a significant, therefore, position at court, because what one's got to remember with some of these office holders is, of course, if you were the sort of gentleman of the stool or gentleman of the bedchamber, it meant you had very immediate access to the monarch. So you were very much part of the inner sanctum. Um, and I think Elliot is a really interesting, interesting figure. It's just so frustrating that the fort plan, because by that point, that it was part of a separate lease, there's just this great gap in the plan and we don't know what was going on there. Not yet anyway, Chris. Not yet, exactly. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> not, not you'll find out. Yes. 
<laughs> right. Thank you, Chris, for appreciate the time that you've given us to us this morning. Uh, now you can go back to providing more answers to your own questions. Um, listening to you, I think you're still asking a lot of questions as well. Um, but thank you very much for your time. It's much appreciated. Uh, the next talk in this series is on Thursday, the 21st of October, when Imogen Gibbon will give a talk on uh, painting games, sporting art highlights from the National Galleries of Scotland. Imogen has been a keen promoter of sporting art, and I suspect many of you might be following uh, her on uh, social media. After that, we have the Mellon exhibition uh, at, sorry, the, the Mellon lecture at the Turf Club when Richard Wills will give a talk on James Seymour. Uh, he's getting close to publishing the catalogue resume of James Seymour. And in December, Sally Goodseer of the Royal Collections Trust will talk about sporting art and George IV. Going into the new year, we've got talks arranged uh, from the Abe Bailey collection in Cape Town, which Chris will know from his many trips to South Africa, and also the National Sporting Library and Galleries in Virginia, USA. And in between, there's a talk on the Scottish sporting painter, Joseph Crawl. Uh, we will publish a detailed program of titles, speakers, and times in October. So thank you again, everybody, for supporting us today. And thank you again, Chris, for your time. As I said, much appreciated. So the next talk is on 21st of October at 11 o'clock. See you then. Many thanks.